In the real executive power structure, the president serves the military industrial complex. It's cell phone by the international bankers. If there's a revolution, the population just throws out the prime minister or president. The elite stays in power because the public is never aware of who the real enemy is. In Evian, France in 1991, standing before the Bilderberg Group, the apex of the world government power structure, David Rockefeller defined the New World Order as a system of world government serving the international banking elite. For decades, the banker-owned media would attack anyone who dared to warn the public that a dictatorial world government was being constructed right under their nose and that national sovereignty was being deliberately destroyed. And now, after years of denial, the media and the elite themselves are proudly announcing that not only is world government real, but it is the answer to the financial crisis that they carefully engineered. The Bilderberg Group consists of the heads of all of the managing roundtable groups that steer individual countries. Picture the elite power structure of the world as a giant pyramid with only the elite of the elite at the tip top of the capstone. The group has been so secretive that until the mid-1980s, the controlled corporate media denied its existence. Into the late 1990s, coverage only consisted of rare one-line mentions. With the rise of the alternative media, their stranglehold on information has begun to slip. In the spring of 1954, Joseph Redinger, a Polish political advisor and founder of the European movement that would lead to the founding of the European Union, started the Bilderberg Group, an informal and off-the-record conference for political and business elites from European and Western nations. With the help of Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, along with other powerful politicians and businessmen, they organized the first annual Bilderberg meeting at the Hotel de Bilderberg in Oosterbeek, Netherlands. The Prince, a former executive for IG Farben and a former Nazi SS party member before the war, was also an influential executive in the oil industry, working for Royal Dutch Petroleum. As a member of the Dutch royal family and the father of the current matriarch and fellow Bilderberger Queen Beatrix, Bernhard was a very powerful and influential member of the European community. The original stated goals of the Bilderberg Group were to bring together the leaders of business, finance and politicians from Europe and Western nations in a forum that would allow for candid and frank discussions of international issues without the fear of being quoted or recorded. Thus, the meetings are held in secret and are by invitation only. For almost 60 years, the Bilderberg Group has been meeting behind closed doors in luxury hotels around the world to discuss in secret their plan for global control of world events and markets. Over the years, their members have included heads of state, politicians, business executives, media moguls, global financiers, military leaders, intelligence agencies, and many other powerful organizations and individuals whose reach extends to every corner of the world. We want to make sure that we can get documentation of the attendees just to have uh, confirmation of who is in attendance. Once you know, um, you can absolutely confirm who is in attendance. You can have a better feel for what are some of the things that are going to be discussed talk about the 99% but it's really the 99.99999% because the people that are in here they're not one out of a hundred they're not one out of a thousand they're not one out of ten thousand a hundred thousand they're more like one out of a million or ten million or beyond that okay that's right it's the You're billionaire and trillionaire club and you and I we're not in it we're not ever gonna be in it so we got to hold their feet to the fire We've got to expose what's going on here. We've got to find out who the 2012 attendees are, and we've got to keep our eyes on the headlines in the next coming weeks, months, and even years to see what these associations have done geopolitically, because they'll be in the headlines. When you have someone like Davignon 
claiming, and not really claiming because he's on the inside, he would know better than you and I, that the Bilderberg Group was instrumental in creating the European Union and the Euro. I would say that's a pretty big deal. And whether that's evil or not, that's a geopolitical move. And that decision was made by this group. Hey, that's the boss. The boss is leaving. Etienne Davignon is the honorary chairman of the Bilderberg Group as well as the head of its steering committee. The committee he heads selects and invites each year's attendees. Billionaire financier David Rockefeller of Chase Manhattan Bank has been a steady donor to the Bilderberg meetings and has been a cornerstone of the group's development attending nearly every conference since its inception in 1954. Rockefeller is an honorary lifetime chairman of the Bilderberg Group and has been involved in the development of many other powerful globalist think tanks such as the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations. In 1965, David Rockefeller gave a speech to the International Industrial Conference in San Francisco where he said, we have entered upon an era in which interdisciplinary cooperation on a worldwide basis must be the cornerstone of accomplishment. Each of us has the duty to fashion his own contribution to fit the grand design of a global community. For many of us, the marketplace of tomorrow will be no less than this whole planet of Earth. What we do will manifest itself in ways that we cannot foretell and it will have an unforeseen impact upon individual lives and whole societies. What we are is God's gift to man. What we become is man's gift to God. A lot of these globalists, a lot of these Bilderbergers are on the record saying that they want global depopulation and they're proud of it. War criminal Henry Kissinger has stepped foot in the Westfield Marriott Hotel in Chantilly, Virginia. So we have him on video entering the hotel and we would like for you gentlemen to go inside the hotel and arrest Kissinger for his war crimes. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger has been deeply involved in the Bilderberg Group, attending dozens of their meetings over the years and acting on the Bilderberg Steering Committee. Kissinger faces allegations of war crimes for his involvement in the secret bombing campaign that took place in Cambodia during the Vietnam War in the 1970s. It is alleged that Kissinger willfully engaged in the murder of tens of thousands of civilians in various areas of Cambodia, which led to the destabilization of the country into a civil war, resulting in the rise of the infamous Khmer Rouge. Kissinger is also wanted in several countries for his involvement in supporting the Pinochet regime and the CIA-backed coup that took place in Chile on September 11, 1973. Pinochet, who is now facing a war crimes tribunal, murdered the democratically elected President Salvador Allende and started a military junta which resulted in the kidnapping, forced displacement and torture of thousands of men, women and children in Chile. Henry Kissinger actively supported these actions that were taking place at that time which constituted crimes against humanity. Kissinger was also involved in a controversial study in 1974 called National Security Study Memorandum 200 in which the basic thesis called for an active campaign for the depopulation of several less developed countries to stem the risk for civil unrest. Are you still giving out orders like Memorandum 200 where you said depopulation should be the hell? Sir, just a question. I'm not going to go to hell because... Memorandum 200, sir? Where did you Memorandum 200? Just ask him a question about Memorandum 200 that he wrote in April 24, 1974. It's an honest question. Okay. Kissinger, Memorandum 200. Depopulation. 
We're on topic now. We I came know. here. We give you the access. If you want to burn bridges, you can do that. I don't want to burn any bridges. I did. I wasn't disrespectful. I wasn't accusatory. It was a serious We're question. We're on topic. Okay, I understand that. So, what about the depopulation? I mean, memorandum 200. Uh, why, why, why are you afraid to talk why about your depopulation plan? Why don't you get lost? Why should I get lost? It's serious. Sick person. Sick person. How am I sick? You're the one committing. Oh. What does it do when you get 120 of the most powerful people in the world getting together to have meetings with government officials? I mean, that that's amazing. Well, it is. This is what I mean, is that they're planning the corporate agenda. They're not uh, planning the uh, democratic human journey agenda, in my opinion. Mussolini had a, a definition, is when the interests of the corporation take completely over from all other interests, and that's fascism. He said it should probably be called corporatism. Well, call it corporatism, call it fascism, call it neo-lib, neo, -lib, neo -con There's a whole variety of political words, depending on which side of the stripe you come from, to start with, which describes the thing. But what they are describing is the complete end of democracy, the end of what matters to people, the end of what happens to the human journey. And for that reason, I think this is revolting. In the last decade, the list of attendees has been leaked to reporters by moles on the inside. Veteran newspaper reporter Jim Tucker has been covering the Bilderberg meetings for over 30 years and has physically attended more than 20. We traveled back to our hotel to see if Jim Tucker received the 2006 list. First heard about Bilderberg in 1975, and I said, I don't believe it. That's not possible. Who in, he who in hell's Bilderberg? I spent 20 happy years with metropolitan newspapers. All the wires are clicking at my ear. That could not happen without me knowing about it. And the thing that first impressed me most was calls in 1957 by the late, great Westbrook Pegler, widely syndicated columnist. He wrote two lengthy columns about how approximately 100 leaders of international finance, heads of state, high public officials were meeting behind armed guards to close doors on Jekyll Island, sealed off. What are these powerful internationalists doing? And why is it so secret? Why do they have armed guards outside? Why is it sealed off? The newspapers totally ignore it. Not a word. Total blackout in the United States. Since then, I've never stopped pursuing Bilderberg or the whole international gangster organization led by Rockefellers and Rothschilds as they manipulate the world for their own selfish interest. Bilderberg was founded by David Rockefeller and the Rothschilds in Britain and Europe. Uh, they're still uh, the main powers. Baron Evelyn de Rothschild, a male, uh, attended for many years, Rothschild is still represented. You'll see them on the list of participants. Somebody representing the Rothschild group. They are the main powers uh, behind Bilderberg. Dutch World Shell is part of the Queen's uh, fortune. Uh, of course, the Rockefellers have, have always had heavy oil interest. That was the original source of, the, of uh, their old money, of the old man. My name is Daniel Lesterlin and uh, I've been uh, doing this for the last 15 years. Uh, I'm from Canada. I'm very proud of my country because, uh, as you can see, there are a lot of people covering the Bilderberg Conference. Last year, uh, it took me 14 and a half hours to get to uh, Munich. I was pulled off a plane in Milan. I was pulled off a plane in Munich. They interrogated me four hours in both places. I was able to call a friend, a journalist in, uh, in Rome, as a result of his presence and others calling the foreign ministry department in Italy, they backed off and they let me go. They basically told me that they'll keeping an eye on me 24 hours of the day. Uh, the little hotel where we were staying at, Jim and I, out of the 20 rooms, six were occupied, three by the CIA and three by the uh, German Secret Service. Uh, that's how serious these people are and that's how afraid they are of actually what we may be able to reveal and what we actually do reveal publicly about the Bilderberger intents. Daniel Estelin has covered the Bilderberg meetings in Europe and North America for more than 15 years. His book, Club Bilderberg, has been translated into more than 20 languages and is a global bestseller. Estelin has photographed many past Bilderberg meetings. 
major village of Maria Monte. Uh, over the last couple of years, they've been reeling with the amount of leakage that they've been experiencing, so it's getting harder and harder. But again, it will never get too hard for us because of the sources that we have inside are top-notch sources. People who are actually working for them, the Secret Service, the second layer, uh, people in the Bilderbergers, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the clerks, the, uh, the administrative office, they are there. They, you know, they are our eyes and ears, and uh, every time there's something out, we always get the information. That's uh, Francisco Pinto Barcelona. I think that's the queen. You see her? Yes. Oh my sure. God. What usually happens, uh, the Secret Service guys who are protecting the uh, the Bilderberg delegates, uh, the staff, the cooks, the chefs. When they actually get to see and to hear what some of these uh, nasty people are talking about, uh, they're the first ones to look for us and the first ones to make sure that we get the information uh, from the meeting. We, uh, again, we're very rigorous with information that does come out. We double, triple and quadruple the uh, confirmed the sources, make sure that all the information checks out. A lot of the stuff, the bill because have planted information, make sure that you know, this disinformation nullifies the, the, the accuracy of the reporting. The decisions that these people take, again, they not only decisions affect business community, they affect uh, politics, business, environment across the entire spectrum. And these decisions are made and taken by a very elite group of people behind closed doors this year at the Brook Street Hotel. We are not private to these decisions. We're not allowed to know what they're talking well, about. You know, but we'll definitely feel the consequences of these decisions over the next 12 months when events which apparently by accident seem to happen, in fact, have been planned right here this year at Brook Street Hotel between 8th and 11th of June. Bilderberg is an elite organization, and the way it works, the, the, the protocol of the meetings is the staff, after they're vetted out, they're told exactly how they're supposed to uh, behave themselves, meaning that they can never address the attendees, they can never speak to them unless they're spoken to first, they can never look them in the eye. They have to approach them from the right side, the people who are right-handed, and from the left side, the people who are left-handed. They can never look them straight on, and uh, needless to say, all the information that is being spoken and during the conferences is under no circumstances allowed to come out. That's what they're told. They're threatened with uh, not being able to find another job anywhere in the sector if they reveal any information to the press. Now, I think what is very difficult for most people to understand is how such a small group of 125 men and a few women control a population base of 6 billion people. Actually, it's much easier than you think. These people work on what I call a systemic methodology, meaning that you take a pie, just imagine you take an apple pie and you slice this apple pie into lots of very small pieces, and you put in front of each one of these pieces your men or women of trust, and by controlling this individual, you control an entire organization. For example, if you take Paul Wolfowitz, who runs the, uh, the World Bank, uh, through him you can control the entire organization. You don't need to control what the dishwasher or the toilet cleaner thinks or does or believes in. You just need to control what he does and what he believes in. And what he does will permeate the entire organization. And that's how you control with very, very small power base an entire global population of, of 6 billion people. And throughout history, we've had people with power attempting to consolidate their power and hold on to it. So that's really the agenda here. The agenda is to stay as powerful as possible for as long as possible and crush any competition. Every four years, Bilderberg meets in North America. And in June of 2006, we decided to travel to Ottawa the capital of Canada. The site of Bilderberg. In Bilderberg's long history, many reporters attempting to cover the group have been harassed, detained, and even jailed. I jokingly reassured my cameramen that the horror stories we'd read about were probably exaggerated. I was wrong. We know reporters get detained at airports, people aren't let in. We know people get uh, uh, you know, sent to the jailhouse for three or four hours. It happens every time. Well, it happened to Alex Jones this time. They admitted Bilderberg, that they've had pressure put on them by the government. 
uh, to heighten security and that that's why all this happened. Yes, I was told that by two separate people. They scoured our records for hours yesterday and hours today trying to find something on us and of course there was nothing. It was just scary. I mean, I've, again, I've been all over the world and I've never seen anything like this. It was like hours of humiliation. And they said, what are you here for? And I said, well, I'm here to, you know, cover the media, co covering a political event, I hope to talk to some members of parliament. I was answering all the questions. It was clear I wasn't a threat. It was clear I didn't have any criminal record. It was clear I was pressed. It was clear I was coming to interview people. They were going to deny me. They told me earlier that, 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 that I was probably going to be denied. And then you guys showed up and everything changed. So what's your plan now? My plan is to go out and try to interview Jim Tucker, to try to go down to the Bilderberg Group. On the outskirts of the national capital today, black limousines with darkened windows converged on a hotel where private security guards imposed ironclad control. The limos carried royalty, political power brokers, and industrial titans to a secret meeting that will last all weekend. It's known as the Bilderberg Group. Could their objective be world domination? There are several rings of security service. The American delegation at every Bilderberg meeting is usually protected by the CIA and a special division of the U.S. Army. The British delegation is protected by the MI6. The Israelis usually are protected by the Mossad. The Ottawa police, in this case, working for the security, they uh, have very little, actually they don't have any information at all about what the meeting is about. They don't even know who the Bilderbergs are. Then there is a, uh, an elite uh, uh, private firm protecting the perimeter, doing all the dirty work, such as shooing off the photographers and, and, and bothering uh, the protesters. But, you know, that's like piddly stuff. All the heavy stuff is done by the security service, such as the CIA, MI6. We are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis, and the nations will accept the new world order. David Rockefeller. We saw David Rockefeller and uh, the current black at the uh, beyond the hotel, and they have no, had no bodyguards. One of my friends shouted, "Hey, Rockefeller!" and he turned back, uh, and he uh, was uh, afraid. <laughs> My name is Rene. I'm from uh, Manitoba. Drove about 26 hours to get here, uh, just to show my uh, that I'm against the Bilderbergers, just to fight for my freedoms, fight for my rights, uh, make sure that my children can grow up uh, in a free country. Rockefeller frontman Henry Kissinger is always a key participant. Here you see the president of the CFR, Richard N. Haas, followed by vice chairman of Rothschild Europe. Franco Barnaby, who is speaking with Henry Kravitz, and behind them is Richard Holbrook, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. The head of Daimler Chrysler, Jürgen Eric Shrimp, arrives by helicopter. Here the owner of the Washington Post, Donald Graham, escorts Indra Nui, the head of PepsiCo. Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands, whose father, Prince Bernhard, founded Bilderberg, is a leading figure in the group. Of course, globalist kingpin David Rockefeller, seen here with his bodyguard, James Ford, always attends. The then newly appointed World Bank Chief Paul Wolfowitz is photographed at Bilderberg 2005. It has been reported that Wolfowitz had attended previous meetings while still the Deputy Secretary of Defense, a violation of the Logan Act. Under the Logan Act, it is a felony offense for any member of the federal or state government to meet with members of a foreign government without the express authority and authorization of the President or Congress. Put simply, it is illegal for members of the government to meet secretly behind closed doors with foreign power brokers due to the problems of corruption and espionage that it breeds. For this reason, many prominent politicians attend, but their names do not appear on the official list. Despite the Logan Act, the governor of New York's name, George Pataki, does appear on the list, and we were able to catch the governor on tape, walking with David Rockefeller at Brook Street. They're upset about the fact that they're being exposed. 
Well, I'm sure they are. I mean, look at the tinted windows. Uh, they, they don't want to be seen. They don't want even anybody to know they're here. So I'm sure they're ticked. You know, and that's why we're here to try to expose them. Do you think if they were angry that they were on the front page of the local paper today? You think they're in there reading it right now, Jim? Uh, yes, I don't think they're happy about it. They prefer nothing at all, no publicity. They pr prefer absolute secrecy. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here in Canada today to stand up against the Bilderberg Group that is attempting to get rid of the sovereignty of the United States. The truth of your world government has now been exposed. We know you are ruthless. We know you are evil. To David Rockefeller, to the Rothschild representatives here, to the Queen of the Netherlands, to all of you, we tell you, you are not our queens, you are not our kings, you are not our gods, we do not belong to you, we are not your slaves, we stand as free humans have stood since the beginning of time against the strong men, against the thugs, against the bullies. We will defeat your world government, we will defeat world taxation, we will defeat your control grid. God is on our side. I stand before the creator of the universe. And I ask the creator of the universe, as our founding fathers did in 1776, to lead God and direct us, and to give us the power, and the foresight, and the understanding, and the will to stand against your entire agenda, including your final plan of world population reduction of 80% that Henry Kissinger penned in 1973. Why do you put mercury in the vaccines, stannous sodium fluoride in the water? Why? Why do you put cancer viruses in the vaccines? Why have you used depleted uranium now in four separate nations? You're arrogant. You have the sickness that elites have had throughout history in their literal and, in some cases, figurative ivory towers. You believe that you're invincible. You will and you are failing now. Your new world order will fall. Humanity will defeat you. The answer to 1984 is 1776. We went into downtown Ottawa and talked to locals to learn if they were aware of the elite meeting in their city. In the city, around 10% of the people were aware of the New World Order agenda. When we traveled to Parliament, close to half of the people we randomly spoke to were informed. Ma'am, what did you say about the American Union? He said, it's, it's going to end up happening. We don't want it, but it's going to happen. <laughs> Why do you think? Because the Bilderberg Group runs the world. You have the Trilateral Commission that's also part of the Bilderberg, which is the uh, United States, Europe, and Asia. But most of this is public knowledge. Nobody wants to believe that there are conspiracies uh, that... Yeah world leaders are already elected before they're voted on. Uh, so here we know that Bernard Lord uh, is part of the outer circle. Um, I, I was surprised to read that uh, Harper addressed the group in 2003 uh, because my understanding was nobody gets into politics without becoming a part of the Bilderberg group and then you find out afterwards that that is the case that they have. Well yeah, well, Bill Clinton went there in 91, George Bush Sr. back in like 85. And Blair, same thing. Who we think that we're electing as leaders are, have already been pre-picked for us. Whether it's liberal or a conservative, they're already part of the group. Uh, they own all the horses in the race. They own the horses, and I understand that, for example, in the United States, it's a one-party system with two factions, uh, though you think it's, it's two different uh, parties. Oh, it is, yeah. So. It's like Bill Clinton constantly vacations with the Bushes, and they call him their son, and they actually staged all that in 92, and all that's come out. It's just all staged. They're not going to let trillions of dollars slip through their hands. The good news is people are waking up, though. When you read human history, when you study it, all, it, all you see is elites trying to dominate, subterfuge, Machiavellian backstabbing. And somehow in the last 50 years, they convinced Westerners that the government's fine, can do no wrong, trust them. How did this happen? <laughs> it's easy to lead sheep. I mean, people just follow. They don't want to believe these things will happen. No way. We'll just follow along with the norm. That's all. It's just an, makes it easier for everyone. The Bilderberg Group sits at the top of the world power structure. 125 of the richest and most influential individuals on the globe make up its membership. 
From Istanbul, Turkey to Chantilly, Virginia, we have tracked the elusive Bilderberg group. Bilderberg always insist on a media blackout. By June of 2008, we had already figured out that Barack Obama was the elite's puppet of choice. The national media claimed that during the weekend the Bilderberg group was scheduled to meet, that Obama had speaking engagements set for Chicago and the Midwest. We knew better. In a classic bait-and-switch, the Obama campaign told the press corps to get on Obama's campaign plane and that Obama would join them on the flight to Chicago. Campaign staff then slammed the door shut. The fawning press had been shanghaied as Obama's campaign aircraft lifted off without Obama. Robert, why were we not told about this meeting and that the senator wouldn't be on our flight until the doors were shut and we were about to taxi to take off? Again, uh, 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 you know, uh, we had a desire, Senator Obama had a desire to do some meetings. Others had a desire to meet with him tonight in a private way, and that's what we're doing. Uh, we set up these meetings. They're being they're being done tonight. Again, I, I'm. I, Is there more than one meeting? Is there more than one person with whom? I'm meeting? not going to get into all the details of the meetings. I, I I I don't know that I've got a ton more different answers for all of your questions. Obama wasn't going to Chicago. He had a meeting to attend. A secret meeting. Initially, it was believed that the secret meeting took place at Clinton's Washington, D.C. home. Obama's spokesman denied that, but won't confirm where the former rivals met. He also declined to comment on their topics of discussion. For a day and a half, the mainstream media engaged in a wild goose chase, trying to find out where Hillary and Obama had gone. Three cover stories later, the corporate press had to admit they had no idea where the two candidates had gone. And to this day, Clinton and Obama aren't talking. Plenty of sources knew about this meeting, uh, told us and others that it was at Hillary Clinton's house, but clearly uh, it wasn't. In 2008, the trail led us to the Westfields Marriott Hotel, right outside Washington, D.C. We just flew into Washington, D.C. We're driving to the Westfields Marriott. Tomorrow the hotel's closed throughout the week, into the weekend for the Bilderberg Group meeting. But we're gonna check in the night before they're gonna kick us out tomorrow. So we're going directly into the belly of the beast. The hotel will be filled with at least five spy agencies, CIA, Defense Intelligence, Mossad, uh, European Union Security. We checked into the Westfields Marriott 48 hours before hotel guests were scheduled to be thrown out ahead of the annual meeting. The building was nestled in the heart of the military-industrial complex, with the National Reconnaissance Office and Raytheon just a stone's throw away. During the entire two-day event, anti-New World Order protesters and alternative media encircled the hotel. You are being exposed everywhere! From David Rockefeller, from John Edwards, from Bill Clinton! Your game of secrecy is over! You're not going play, get it, game! It's up close! You piece of trash! You piece of trash! This is Bernanke, man! Bernanke, you're going down! Obama, we know you're here, Obama. You cleared your schedule for the next three days. We know you're in Virginia. Arch criminals! New World Order scum! We are not your slave scum! Brave Americans came from all over the United States and bullhorned the main conference hall at close range as the global power brokers schemed inside. The global elite are desperate to keep their organizational meetings a secret. They are keenly aware that if the population discovers that policy is being developed covertly by powerful special interests, the people will revolt. It is our duty to expose these criminals. It's a criminal act uh, under federal law for our federal officials to have private meetings to discuss world policy uh, with uh, non 
uh, non-federal workers. So everybody from the State Department, Treasury Department, White House, Defense Department, and others who show up as they always do, they're committing a criminal act simply by being here to attend a secret meeting with officials from other countries to, to discuss U.S. policy in the world. So literally it's a criminal act. And every newspaper, every broadcaster has a patriotic duty to expose these scum and the uh, evil they, pro they project. In June of 2006, our team traveled to Ottawa, Canada to gather intelligence on the shadow government's agenda for the coming years. I think that's the Queen! Investigative journalist and best-selling author Daniel Estelin had been tracking the Bilderberg Group for more than 16 years. His moles inside Bilderberg informed him that the elite were planning to first run the price of gas up to $150 a barrel. Unimaginable in 2006. He also reported that after suckering the middle class back into the stock market, the group was going to implode the subprime mortgage market and destroy public confidence. Well, one of the things that you know we're getting from this morning, this afternoon's conference, this morning conference was about the uh, the the energy crisis, the price of oil. This the afternoon conference, which started about four o'clock, four four thirty. They were talking about uh, one of the American delegates. I I wasn't told who exactly it was. Was talking about the uh, <clears throat> the concern that the American citizens have had with the with, you know with the housing prices going down. So they're not investing that money. So what they needed to do is they needed to create the illusion that everything is going well. So what they're going to do over the next year, year and a half is to bring the market back up to 1998, 1999 levels. They're going to get all the suckers to invest whatever little money they have left over. <clears throat> and that's when they're going to make the economy bottom drop out. They need to destroy the economy because as we're running out of oil, when people don't travel, at least that's what they're saying, when people don't travel, when people don't have money, they don't travel, they don't spend any money, which means you don't waste a lot of uh, 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 oil and natural gas. That's the afternoon. So how does this source, I mean, just ballpark, I mean, so, so you have the sources that... Well, actually, there are two people uh, who are members of the Bilderberg Club. It's actually members that are... They're members sources. of the Bilderberg Club who, for years and years and years, have been going and participating in all the conversations. They've always been dead on, always. And last year, they said the oil prices are going to go up to 150. At the time, it was 39. It went up to 76, yeah. basically doubled. If it doubles again, it's going to be back to where these people... They attack Iran and will it on Year after year, Estelin and other reporters like Jim Tucker are able to report on future events with stunning accuracy. All because they know the agenda of the Bilderberg Group. In recent years, the lack of coverage from the mainstream media on the Bilderberg Group has been a problem as far as raising awareness about these conferences. However, 2012 is a major turning point for the Bilderberg Group as the independent media have been here providing the coverage that's been lacking from the mainstream. Where's Fox News been for the last 15 years? CNN for the last 20 years? Why does Sean Hannity ridicule anybody that calls in and asks about the significance of the Bilderberg Group? Obviously, they're on the payroll. When people say that, quote, they control the media, they're talking about the secret establishment. 501c3 tax-exempt foundations have to make certain forms publicly available. And so somebody tipped me off about this, that the 990 forms are available for the Bilderberg Group. And I got the years 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. Well, first of all, they're operating under the 501c3 tax-exempt name American Friends of Bilderberg. The 2008 forms also show a list of very interesting donors. Henry Kissinger, $20,000. David Rockefeller, $50,000. Freeport McMormon Foundation, ten dollars Microsoft, $75,000. Peter Thiel from PayPal, $75,000. Goldman Sachs, $25,000. The Washington Post, $25,000. So of course the Washington Post is going to be reluctant to report on them when they are literally funding them and I have the proof in my hand. This group is meeting with government officials. It violates federal law, the Logan Act. And 
for decades they said it didn't even exist. This is the real oligarchs that run our government, run Europe, run most of the world to the big central banks and the fraud that they engage in. These are the real tyrants. So we're identifying them, not the puppet presidents and prime ministers. We're going directly to the financial oligarch, the robber barons. In their efforts to maintain the control of information globally, influential figures of the media have been routinely invited to participate in the conferences over the years. Peter Mansbridge of CBC's The National attended the meeting in 2010 and has maintained their strict rules for secrecy ever since. Fellow Canadian Heather Reisman is the CEO of Indigo Books, the largest book supplier in Canada, and she is a member of the Bilderberg Steering Committee. In 2005, Reisman founded the Hesag Foundation, which provides grants to former lone soldiers in the Israeli army to pursue post-secondary education. A lone soldier is an individual who is not from Israel, but chooses to fight in the Israeli military. Other media moguls and organizations that have attended the Bilderberg meetings over the years have included Rupert Murdoch of News Corporation, Andrew Knight of News Corporation and The Economist, Ted Turner of Time Warner and CNN, Charlie Rose, Donald Graham of The Washington Post, and Canadian media baron and former Bilderberg Steering Committee member Conrad Black of Hollinger International and The Telegraph newspaper. While all of these powerful media organizations have been present at Bilderberg meetings over the years, there has remained a media blackout all across the board regarding coverage of this group. Hi. I was just uh, wondering uh, what your opinions were. You talk a little bit about it in the book of uh, the influence of the Bilderberg group on uh, the mainstream media or on just the influence. Yeah, you know, you, you, the individuals are influential, but they don't, their influence isn't magnified by Bilderberg. I went for 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's just a talking shop, and they're almost always wrong, by the way. They didn't see the end of the Cold War coming. They didn't see the economic crisis coming. They're very interesting meetings. They're very interesting people. People, but they're not coherent. They aren't a group that meets other than for three days a year, and the composition of them changes all the time, except for about 30 of us who are on the steering committee. And how come? And don't buy into these conspiracy theories. It's rubbish. All they do is talk to each other. I, I was on that conference circuit for 20 years, the Trilateral Commission, and I went to all of them. And uh, yeah, look, it was fine while it lasted, but I'm getting too old for that. I'm getting mm -hmm. tired. But, okay. You know. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thanks right. for coming. But there's no conspiracy in any of them. No. But no, there's just a bunch of people. How come you don't ever hear about it in the media? Like, I only read well, about they, it in your they book. They don't allow the media. No. But in order to encourage people to talk frankly, so what you do, you get good frank sessions. Mm. But but there's no there's no meeting of the minds particularly. Mm. Okay. All right, thank you. Fellow Hollinger International Board of Directors member Marie Jose Kravis has made significant inroads since being invited to Bilderberg by Conrad Black in 1989. Marie Jose is the wife of Bilderberg member Henry Kravis and has been a member of the Bilderberg Steering Committee for over 22 years. At the trial of the now defunct media baron Conrad Black, Marie Jose Kravis testified against him, providing evidence for the prosecution. Other prominent Canadians who have attended the Bilderberg conferences include former Prime Minister of Canada Lester B. Pearson, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin, and Stephen Harper. Many other influential Canadian politicians and business leaders have also attended the secret meetings, including former NDP leader Bob Ray, former Liberal Party leaders Stefan Dion and Michael Ignatieff, former Premier of Ontario Mike Harris, former Premier of New Brunswick Bernard Lord, former Premier of British Columbia Gordon Campbell, 
the Premier of Alberta, Alison Redford, the Chief of Staff for Prime Minister Stephen Harper, Nigel S. Wright, and Power Corporation of Canada CEO, Paul Desmarais Sr. In fact, nearly every Canadian Prime Minister, back to Pierre Elliott Trudeau, has worked for Power Corp. I attended one Bilderberg meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not sure they ever invited me back, but, the, um, but, uh, but just to make sure, I've also gone to a Maple Leaf hockey game. That doesn't mean I'm a Maple Leaf fan. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I believe that there is an opportunity now with the G20 having been, having been called for the first time for us to put together a global steering committee of all the great powers of the world. If I was asked what is the single most important thing that can be done to get us out of this mess, it is going to be to recognize now that we are one common humanity, divided perhaps into economic entities called countries. The time has come for us to work together. In 1996, you were at uh, a Bilderberg meeting, and also there was uh, Jean Chrétien and uh, Paul Martin. I don't know if I was at that meeting. I've only been to a few of them, but I, uh, Bilderberg and Trilateral are, are not really think tanks. They, they, they simply individuals who get together, who are from um, business, the political world, the media, others, and discuss ideas, and they influence each other through that. In 2008, it was revealed that the Canadian government, under the leadership of Bilderberg member Stephen Harper, would be buying $25 billion worth of mortgage pools through the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Shortly after the election in October of 2008, the re-elected Harper Conservatives unilaterally announced the government will purchase up to an additional $50 billion of insured mortgage pools by the end of the fiscal year as a part of its ongoing efforts to maintain the availability of longer-term credit in Canada. This action will increase to $75 billion, the maximum value of securities purchased through Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. There was no debate in the Canadian Parliament over whether to hand out $75 billion in taxpayer money to the private chartered banks, nor was it covered by the Bilderberg-controlled mainstream media. The control of the Bilderberg Group extends not only to the media and the control of information, but also to the Canadian banking system itself and our ability to control our own currency. In 1938, Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King nationalized the Bank of Canada, giving control of the Canadian currency to the people of Canada. Although the issuance of currency is held solely by the Bank of Canada, the creation of credit through the issuance of loans is still largely controlled by private chartered banks. As part of the Bank of Canada's charter, the government can borrow up to 50% of its own money from the Bank of Canada at 0% interest. The other half of the interest is paid back into the government, allowing for the financing of our own infrastructure, such as the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Trans-Canada Highway. Because of Bilderberg member Paul Martin, Canada now borrows its money from the private chartered banks at the going interest rate effectively handing over the usury and interest to private corporations. Prior to Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, all banks had to hold an 8% reserve, meaning they could lend out the same money 12 and a half times through credit and loans. Mulroney dropped this to a 0% reserve, allowing private banks to loan as much money as they want, simply by entering a new line on a ledger. Currently, the Bank of Canada is only responsible for 5% of the actual debt created in the form of currency. The private chartered banks, such as Royal Bank of Canada and TD Bank, own the remaining 95% of all debt. Think of how much control this amounts to when you consider all of the digital payment and loan options used today, such as credit cards, debit cards, internet payments, RFID chips, smartphone purchases, and even biometric identification which is now used in India for bank withdrawals. Very few people use real currency 
and the trend is turning to an increasing reliance on digital and computer technologies, of which are largely controlled by members of the Bilderberg Group. Members of the Bilderberg Group who are involved in the Canadian banking system include President and CEO of Royal Bank of Canada, Gordon Nixon. President and CEO of TD Bank Financial Group, Edmund Clark. Deputy Chair of TD Bank Financial Group and former Canadian Ambassador to the United States, Frank McKenna. Former Minister of Finance and Director of Manulife Financial, Michael Wilson. Managing Director of Credit Suisse Securities, Ronald S. Lloyd. Former CEO of Scotiabank, Peter C. Godso. Former Governor of the Bank of Canada, David A. Dodge. And Governor of the Bank of Canada and former Goldman Sachs executive, Mark Kearney. The reach of the Bilderberg Group extends to every level of the policy apparatus in both the private and public sectors. Its members over the years have been the most influential and powerful individuals in the world. Whether or not they act in concert with each other or simply influence one another through these meetings is beside the point. The decisions made by each of these individuals have a ripple effect for the rest of the world. For every action, there is an equal but opposite reaction. The creation of this new Orwellian technotronic society has spawned a new generation of warrior, information warriors whose weapons are the very technologies created to enslave them. As the old forms of media slowly die away, this generation is finding new and exciting ways to spread information, open dialogue, and become the true citizen media. The Bilderberg Group and the individuals that attend are now facing a revolutionary adversary, an informed citizenry armed with the right questions and looking for the true answers. The ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one world government run by the banking industry, run by the bankers, where, and, and they're doing it in sections. The, the European currency, the euro, and, and the European constitution is one part of it. Now they're trying to do it in America with the North American Union, right? And they want to create a new currency called the Amero, right? And uh, the, whole, the, the whole agenda is to create a one world government where everybody has an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, anytime you have money in your, in your, in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. And you have nothing. You can't buy food. You can't do anything. It's total control of the people. And that chip's connected to a database that has your purchasing records, what you do, what everything, you sell. Everything is in there, you know? And so they, they want a one world government controlled by them, everybody being chipped, all your money in those chips, and they control the chips and they control the people. And you become a slave, you become a serf to these people. That's their goal, that's their intentions. Eric, can you be specific about when you met Rockefeller, how it happened in these discussions? I met Rockefeller through a female attorney I knew who called me up one day and said, uh, one of the Rockefellers would like to meet you. I had made a video called Mad as Hell, and uh, he'd seen the video and wanted to meet me and knew I was running for governor of Nevada. So sure, I'd love to meet him. And I met him, and I liked him, and uh, uh, he was a very, very smart man. And uh, we used to talk and share ideas and thoughts. And um, he's the one who told me uh, 11 months before 9-11 ever happened that there was going to be an event Never told me what the event was going to be, but there was going to be an event, and out of that event, uh, we were going to invade Afghanistan to run uh, pipelines from the Caspian Sea. 
we're going to invade Iraq, you know, to take over the oil fields, establish a base in the Middle East, and make it all part of the New World Order. And we go after Chavez in Venezuela. And uh, sure enough, later 9-11 happened. And I remember he was telling me how, <laughs> how you're going to see soldiers looking in caves for people in, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and all these places. And, it's, and there's going to be this war on terror, uh, which is no real enemy. And the whole thing is a giant hoax. You know, but it's a way for the government to take over the American people. He told you it was going to be a hoax. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no question. He says, there's going to be war and terror. And he's just laughing. There's no... <laughs> Who are we fighting? I mean, why do you think 9-11 happened and then nothing's happened since then? Do you think that our security is so great here that these people who pulled off 9-11, who were able to... can't knock down another plane? Come on, it's ridiculous. 9-11 was done by people in our own government and our own banking system to perpetuate the fear of the American people into subordinating themselves to anything the government wants them to do. That's what it's about, and to create this, war, this endless war on terror. And, that's why we, and that was the first lie. And the next lie was going into Iraq, you know, uh, to uh, get Saddam Hussein out with his weapons of mass destruction. That was the next lie. Now, now specifically, this was a little over six years ago. This was uh, eleven months before nine eleven. Yeah. And Nick Rockefeller, he's a lawyer. He is he he's become your friend over the previous years, and he's saying to you that there's going to be this big event, and then out of that we're going to have a war on terror, and it's just going to go on and on. Right. An endless war on terror without, without any real enemy. That you can never so you can never define a winner. And, and uh, did he say that it's going to be perfect because you can't define an enemy? It just goes yeah, on. Yeah, because you can't define a winner. There's no one who has no one to beat, so it goes on and on forever. And they can do whatever they want. They scare the hell out of the American public. Look, this whole war on terror is a fraud. It's a farce. It's very difficult to say it out loud because people are intimidated against saying it. Because if you say it, they want to make you into a nutcase. Let's but the truth, but the truth has to be. The truth has to come out. That's why I'm doing this interview. The fact of the matter happens to be that the whole war on terror is a fraud, it's a farce. The end is a war going on in Iraq, because we invaded Iraq, and people over there fighting, you know. But the war on terror, it's a joke, you know. And until we discover what really happened on 9-11, and who was responsible for 9-11, because that's where the war on terror emanates from. That's where it comes from. It was 9-11 that allowed this war on terror to begin. And until we get to the bottom root, of 9-11, the truth of 9-11, we'll never know about the war on terror. Aaron, you said that he was, and I think it's important, and I know this about the Rockefellers, from Dr. Dennis Cuddy and many others, who literally, he'll be 20 years old in a lunch line at college, and no, it's David Rockefeller. And he hears, I mean, they're experts at recruiting and getting what they call players, and that clearly he was, I mean, I want to make it specific and just get you to reiterate what you said last night uh, about you were, you got 30% of the vote, you were having an effect, you, you, you made mad as hell, they knew that you'd started the Constitution Party, yeah. they knew that you were uh, somebody who was taking action and getting things done, you'd already made some big films, had a lot of other successes, right. so they were trying to recruit you, and, and, and didn't it come down to the point of, hey, we are here to recruit you, and don't worry, your chip's going to say, don't mess with us, you know, this guy's uh, don't touch. Yeah, yes, that did happen, now, I was definitely being recruited. But it's more subtle than that. Well, in your words, just go through the process, and then, and then what he said. Well, well, what it is is, I, remember, we were friends, and we used to have, he used to go to my house a lot. We'd have dinner, we'd talk, and he'd, he'd tell me about business investments that he'd get involved in, you know, or they would help me with this business investment or that business investment. And was I interested in joining the Council on Foreign Relations? You know, I would have to get a letter to join them, but was I interested in that? And, uh, you know, just, uh, just stuff, you know, leading you on. And, and uh, I, I used to say to him that I never really did that because that wasn't where I was coming from. You know, as much as I like you, Nick, you know, your ways and my ways, we're, the, we're on the opposite side of the fence. You know, I don't believe in enslaving people, you know, and... Um, and he would come back with, oh, I do? Or? Well, it would be more like, you it's know... It's better for them. Well, it's more like, you know, um, how do I put it? It was like, what do you care about them? What do you care about those people? 
What difference does it make to you? Take care of your own life. Do the best you can for you and your family. What do the rest of the people mean to you? They don't mean anything to you. They're just serfs. They're just people. You know, it was, it was just a lack of caring, you know? And that's just not who I was. It was just sort of like cold, you know? It was just like cold, you know? And uh, I used to say to him, what, what's the point of all this? You have all the money in the world you need. You have all the power you need. What's the point? You know, what's the end goal? And he said the end goal is to get everybody chipped, to control the whole society, to have the, to have the bankers, the, the elite people, you know, the bankers and some governor controlling the world. What, and, and, and I said, all, do all the people in the Council on Foreign Relations believe this way you do? He said, no, no, no. You know, it, it, most of them believe they're doing the right thing. A lot of them believe it's better, it's better off being socialistic. You know, we have to convince people that capitalism, that socialism is really capitalism. Because America is becoming a socialist country. It's a communist country today. Well, one of the things they told me was that um, he brought, we were, he's at the house one night, and uh, we, were talk, we were talking, and he started laughing. He said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? And uh, I said, I, I had pretty conventional thinking about it at that point. I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote, you know? And he started to laugh. He said, you're an idiot. And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded Women's Lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He said, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was, we couldn't tax half the population before Women's Lib. And the second reason was, now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. It breaks up their family. The, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim the primary reasons for women's love, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. But let me tell you something. When 150 of the most powerful men and women in the world can meet in secret in Baden-Baden, Germany, and plot the fate of billions, and nobody even cares about it, but six football players go to lunch together, and it's in the headlines across the country. You have a reflection of the society in which that exists. And it is a sick, sick society that is doomed to self-destruction. So based on that scenario, there's some truth into what these, these men are looking at. Absolutely, and that's what makes me so sick, is that I'm trying to wake up a people who on a daily basis are proving the ones that I'm warning them about to be right. Mm -hmm. Well, it, so that even though a minority, there are people out there that you recognize are awake to this, if they don't do something about it, they will lose that ability to be free in that way. That's correct. Whether they might think, well, I don't need to worry about it because I know what I know and I'm fine. That's it correct. doesn't work that way. There's yeah. a connection here to everything. That is correct. That is absolutely correct. A nation of people who are willing to send their sons and daughters that they profess that they love to a foreign country to die and they use the excuse to themselves that they're sending them off to defend our country and they know damn well that's a lie are doomed with new ideas uh, about a hundred years ago this big organization with many branches uh, they wanted to rule the world basically using Britain as a nucleus of, of a system, an embryo, uh, which also was going to be joined with the US uh, under the Anglo-American establishment, uh, wrote about the kind of culture and the changes of culture over a hundred year period that they would actually design, implement and bring in. And um, H.G. Wells talked about it too. He talked about arenas. He says arenas could be put up across the world for sports, for instance. Now at that time, sports was something that children, uh, school children were into. 
adults became adults and got onto adult things. So it was unimaginable at the time that people could actually believe that uh, uh, there was even a need for adult sports and entertainment, never mind having ar arenas built across the world. But he said, we can do this. And you know, voiced basically a, a sports culture for the males. Using a tribal system, we're all tribal to an extent, that's why we even bother to vote for a tribal leader. Uh, this is well understood, that's why we're supplied with these leaders. And because the, the average man was to become more disengaged from his own destiny, as the expert class arose, it was decided that, that the males would get their, their, their outlet, basically. Um, being gradually becoming helpless as, as males through sports. Therefore, they'd have a tribal team they could identify with, uh, they could um, cheer them on as they were winning. In their own personal lives, they were getting nowhere. They were getting disenfranchised, in a sense, as experts took over um, decision-making for them in all kinds of fields. So this was psychology at use, uh, planned before they even implemented the sports. That's why they pay athletes these fantastic salaries. I was listening to the radio the other day. They just contracted to pay one, one player on one team six million dollars a year. Can you believe this? And why is that? It's the Roman circus. What does the emperor do when the people become restive? And when the people are asking questions and when the people don't like the policies of the emperor? He sends them to the circus. He creates a circus. He builds a giant coliseum. And he begins to throw the Christians to the lions. And he has great chariot races and football games and basketball games, all to keep the idiots preoccupied with things that don't mean anything in the scheme of the entire world so that they don't have the time to learn what the truth is, so they don't ever get smart enough to learn how they're being manipulated, so they don't ever question the emperor. That's why they pay a player on a football team or a baseball team a million or two million or three million dollars a year. It is the Roman circus. I know men who don't know anything in the world except who plays third base for the Mets. And they think that's a great accomplishment. And they meet and pat each other on the back and bond and go have cocktails and talk about what this guy that plays third base for the Mets did in last night's game. It's sad. It's really sad. A lot of these globalists, a lot of these Bilderbergers are on the record saying that they want global depopulation and they're proud of it. War criminal Henry Kissinger has stepped foot in the Westfields Marriott Hotel in Chantilly, Virginia. We have him on video entering the hotel and we would like for you gentlemen to go inside the hotel and arrest Kissinger for his war crimes. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger has been deeply involved in the Bilderberg Group, attending dozens of their meetings over the years and acting on the Bilderberg Steering Committee. Kissinger faces allegations of war crimes for his involvement in the secret bombing campaign that took place in Cambodia during the Vietnam War in the 1970s. It is alleged that Kissinger willfully engaged in the murder of tens of thousands of civilians in various areas of Cambodia, which led to the destabilization of the country into a civil war, resulting in the rise of the infamous Khmer Rouge. Kissinger is also wanted in several countries for his involvement in supporting the Pinochet regime and the CIA-backed coup that took place in Chile on September 11, 1973. Pinochet, who is now facing a war crimes tribunal, murdered the democratically elected President Salvador Allende and started a military junta, which resulted in the kidnapping, forced displacement, and torture of thousands of men, women, and children in Chile. Henry Kissinger actively supported these actions that were taking place at that time, which constituted crimes against humanity. 
Kissinger was also involved in a controversial study in 1974 called National Security Study Memorandum 200, in which the basic thesis called for an active campaign for the depopulation of several less developed countries to stem the risk for civil unrest. Are you still giving out orders like Memorandum 200, where you said depopulation should be hell? <laughs> sir, just a question. I'm not going to go to hell, because... Memorandum 200, sir? Where did you Memorandum 200? Just ask them a question. A conference for political and business elites from European and Western nations. With the help of Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, along with other powerful politicians and businessmen, they organized the first annual Bilderberg meeting at the Hotel de Bilderberg in Oosterbeek, Netherlands. The Prince, a former executive for IG Farben and a former Nazi SS party member before the war, was also an influential executive in the oil industry, working for Royal Dutch Petroleum. As a member of the Dutch royal family and the father of the current matriarch and fellow Bilderberger Queen Beatrix, Bernhard was a very powerful and influential member of the European community. The original stated goals of the Bilderberg Group were to bring together the leaders of business, finance and politicians from Europe and Western nations in a forum that would allow for candid and frank discussions of international issues, without the fear of being quoted or recorded. Thus, the meetings are held in secret and are by invitation only. For almost 60 years, the Bilderberg Group has been meeting behind closed doors in luxury hotels around the world to discuss in secret their plan for global control of world events and markets. Over the years, their members have included heads of state, politicians, business executives, media moguls, global financiers, military leaders, intelligence agencies, and many other powerful organizations and individuals whose reach extends to every corner of the world. We want to make sure that we can get documentation of the attendees just to have uh, confirmation of who is in attendance. Once you know, um, you can absolutely confirm who is in attendance. You can have a better feel for what are some of the things that are going to be discussed. We can talk about the 99%, but it's really the 99.99999% because the people that are in here, they're not one out of a hundred, they're not one out of a thousand, they're not one out of ten thousand, a hundred thousand, they're more like one out of a million or ten million or beyond that, okay? Billionaire club. That's right. It's the You're billionaire and trillionaire club, and you and I, we're not in it. We're not ever going to be in it. So we got to hold their feet to the fire. We've got to expose what's going on here. We've got to find out who the 2012 attendees are, and we've got to keep our eyes on the headlines in the next coming weeks, months, and even years to see what these associations have done geopolitically, because they'll be in the headlines. When you have someone like Davignon, claiming, and not really claiming because he's on the inside, he would know better than you and I, that the Bilderberg Group was instrumental in creating the European Union and the Euro. I would say that's a pretty big deal. And whether that's evil or not, that's a geopolitical move. And that decision was made by this group. Hey, that's the boss. Boss is leaving. Etienne Davignon is the honorary chairman of the Bilderberg Group as well as the head of its steering committee. The committee he heads selects and invites each year's attendees. Billionaire financier David Rockefeller of Chase Manhattan Bank has been a steady donor to the Bilderberg meetings and has been a cornerstone of the group's development, attending nearly every conference since its inception in 1954. Rockefeller is an honorary lifetime chairman of the Bilderberg Group and has been involved in the development of many other powerful globalist think tanks such as the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations. In 1965, David Rockefeller gave a speech to the International Industrial Conference in San Francisco where he said, We have entered upon an era in which interdisciplinary cooperation on a worldwide basis must be the cornerstone of accomplishment. Each of us has the duty to fashion his own contribution to fit the grand design of a global community. For many of us, 
the marketplace of tomorrow will be no less than this whole planet of Earth. What we do will manifest itself in ways that we cannot foretell, and it will have an unforeseen impact upon individual lives and whole societies. What we are is God's gift to man. What we become is man's gift to God. Uh, Memorandum 200 that he wrote in April 24, 1974. Okay. It's an honest question. Okay. Kissinger, Memorandum 200. The population. We're on topic now. We I came know. here. We give you the access. If you want to burn bridges? You can do that. I don't want to burn any bridges. I didn't. I wasn't disrespectful. I wasn't accusatory. It was a serious question. We're on topic. Okay. I understand that. So, what about the depopulation? I mean, Memorandum 200. Uh, why, why, why are you afraid to talk why about your depopulation plan? Why don't you get lost? Why should I get lost? It's serious. Sick person. Sick person. How am I sick? You're the one committing. Oh. What does it do when you get 120 of the most powerful people in the world getting together to have meetings with government officials? I mean, that, that's amazing. Well, it is. This is what I mean, is that they're planning the corporate agenda. They're not uh, planning the uh, democratic human journey agenda, in my opinion. Mussolini had a definition is when the interests of the corporation take completely over from all other interests, and that's fascism. He said it should probably be called corporatism. Well, call it corporatism, call it fascism, call it neo-lib, neo There's a whole variety of political words, depending on which side of the stripe you come from, to start with, which describes the thing. But what they are describing is the complete end of democracy, the end of what matters to people, the end of what happens to the human journey. And for that reason, I think this is revolting. In the last decade, the list of attendees has been leaked to reporters by moles on the inside. Veteran newspaper reporter Jim Tucker has been covering the Bilderberg meetings for over 30 years and has physically attended more than 20. We traveled back to our hotel to see if Jim Tucker received the 2006 list. First heard about Bilderberg in 1975, and I said, I don't believe it. That's not possible. Who in, he who in hell's Bilderberg? I spent 20 happy years with metropolitan newspapers. All the wires are clicking at my ear. That could not happen without me knowing about it. And the thing that first impressed me most was caused in 1957 by the late, great Westbrook Pegler, widely syndicated columnist. He wrote two lengthy columns about how approximately 100 leaders of international finance real executive power structure. The president serves the military industrial complex. It's cell phone by the international bankers. If there's a revolution, the population just throws out the prime minister or president. The elite stays in power because the public is never aware of who the real enemy is. In Evian, France in 1991, standing before the Bilderberg Group, the apex of the world government power structure, David Rockefeller defined the New World Order as a system of world government serving the international banking elite. For decades, the banker-owned media would attack anyone who dared to warn the public that a dictatorial world government was being constructed right under their nose, and that national sovereignty was being deliberately destroyed. And now, after years of denial, the media and the elite themselves are proudly announcing that not only is world government real, but it is the answer to the financial crisis that they carefully engineered. The Bilderberg Group consists of the heads of all of the managing roundtable groups that steer individual countries. Picture the elite power structure of the world as a giant pyramid, with only the elite of the elite at the tip top of the capstone. The group has been so secretive that until the mid-1980s, the controlled corporate media denied its existence. Into the late 1990s, coverage only consisted of rare one-line mentions.
With the rise of the alternative media, their stranglehold on information has begun to slip. In the spring of 1954, Joseph Redinger, a Polish political advisor and founder of the European movement that would lead to the founding of the European Union, started the Bilderberg Group, an informal and off-the-record 